excited. That's my echoey, manly clap for today. Happy that I got it right on the first time. Slightly anxious about all the early morning cyclists and joggers who are um, observing us, but that comes with the territory. And as you mentioned also, there is a path behind us. So if somebody takes that, they're going to get immortalized on the internet. <laughs> we'll have to find a way around that. But I'm excited. I think there'll be a lot of guests, as you said, cyclists, bugs. Ah! What? Itsy bitsies. Spiders on your notes. Itsy bitsy spiders. My hope is that we get a squirrel. Yeah, my hope is there aren't any snakes or like toxicities. Yeah, we went right for the brambles. I blew my nose on a leaf yeah, um, real before nature recording. <laughs> And I kind of said, oh, I hope I'm not allergic to this one, which I hopefully, so, hopefully. Far, so far I haven't. Yeah, been. might find out um, halfway through. I have no allergies. <laughs> I have no like allergies. That sounds like something someone would say I if they had allergies. When, when there are, <laughs> he's suspicious now. Yeah. Sounds like someone who has allergies. Yeah. When there are planes going by overhead and, as you mentioned, perhaps sirens in the distance, mm. it's all just the, the ambience. Usually when we record the podcast, we will remove the, the room tone. I think we're going to try and leave it in today. Try and keep the room tone. Unless there's a really angry, like, grunt or something, then maybe. Or someone just shouts at us. Yeah. Oh, you're recording, eh? Mm. We say, yeah. Yeah. You want to speak to the world? Yeah. So we chose to record outside because fresh air is nice, light is nice, and we just prefer being outside. Yeah, I think there were, you can kind of phrase it as in, what we were choosing to record in or also what we were choosing not to record in mm -hmm. because I don't think we ever mentioned on the podcast but we neither of us in, in, enjoy uh, recording the <laughs> podcast in our studio not because we don't don't like conversation um, I think it's very fun but it's the metro of claustrophobia mm. in our studio as we call it studio studio apartment and uh, <laughs> just like cables crossing you know, I always just get silently angry. Yeah, like once we sit down, it's okay. But the hour before, because we have lights, we have our chairs are like aggressively close. It's not like we have a bunch of space. It's like we're in a little closet, basically. And I know some podcasters actually record in a closet for sound really? reasons. Yeah, but we're choosing the opposite. We're choosing vibes over sound quality, perhaps. Yeah, I, I, I suppose I apologize to the listeners. I'm watching a spider scale the trees now. And it's slightly unnerving. Um, I'm an arachnophobe, just putting that out there. <laughs> yeah, I think sound quality we will compromise on a little bit because we're using the lav mics. It makes us feel kind of on the fly, journalists. But I think also, it works with the news semester. I think so. It makes me want to run around. Mm. It makes me want to start doing jumping jacks and stuff. But I think I'll appease myself with just anxiously picking at grasses. Okay, while sounds you speak, good. Maybe whistling something Huckleberry Finn style. Yeah, so we should probably introduce the podcast concept. This is not our first episode of our podcast ever, but it is our first outdoor episode, and we're counting this as a new era, perhaps. The outdoors. Yeah, it's the, it's the debut of shoes, for one thing. Our shoes, shoes have never been on the pod. I know, and yeah. I've spoken about them often enough that I feel like people will probably raise an eyebrow now and say, oh, he's one of those? Mm. I don't know, they can't really see much, but oh, he's one of those polo shirt and running shoe guys. <laughs> Disgusting. It's 7 a.m. You can't, <laughs> you can't knock your fashion sense Happy that Canada much. Happy Canada Day to our fellow Canucks. I'm English, but... <laughs> I'm English and I don't celebrate Canada Day. So but... this semester is all about the news and it has a, a double-fold meaning, right? We're talking about the news of the world, as in Biden v. Trump, oh. as in Middle East. Um, <laughs> we are talking about them and also we're talking about the news of ourselves, kind of using ourselves as case studies. Exactly. But I got ahead of ourselves. Exactly. So what we do on the podcast, period, Whoops. is we imagine a future that is beautiful, sustainable. Tactile. Tactile. <laughs> this is the most tactile episode yet. There will be bug bites. But basically what we do is we spend a few months designing an aspect of this ideal world. So... This time, we're going to be designing the ideal news cycle and, as Aaron said, using our lives as examples instead of always having to draw on existing headlines because most of you have probably already read them or know about them. Yeah, it's not going to be like a topical, here's Aaron and Alicia, that's our names by the way, I'm Aaron, this is Alicia, here's our thoughts on 
Israel. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, there might be a touch of that. There might be a little bit. There might be moments. Things that we, that we do probably know about, but it's more a meta analysis, I think, of how that news is presented and consumed. I don't like the word for art, but I don't mind it for news. That's true. Noted, because news is, it's, it's made to be consumed in its nature. You take it in, it's like, it's like an, a meal, right? Like you go some time between it. Art, it kind of, it trivializes it too much. Content? Like yeah, content, to content, consuming. Okay. But with news, I don't mind consuming. Yeah, that's fair. And yeah, we find on this podcast, our attempt is to make a positive tone, always looking towards this ideal version of things. Yeah. Because there's plenty of negative things, as we both probably discovered today when we were trolling the headlines to bring to you in this episode. Because we're not normally going to talk about headlines too much, but for today we wanted to pick one headline each to dissect. Then we're also going to talk about our ideal version of the news, like personally, like what our ideal consumption of the news would be. Yeah. Regarding the, the positivity, I think we had that phrase that we came up with for Solacine that was like optimistic discontent or something like that mm-hmm. it was basically that you complaining isn't necessarily awful it's a, it's a good place to start and being mm-hmm. critical of things uh, which i think is also why we chose the news cycle uh to kind of reorganize or reimagine because almost everyone it seems is dissatisfied with it, it seems like everyone is just criticizing our oh, 24-hour news you know news media profiteering off of politics and etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm-hmm. um but there aren't too many ideas, at least that I hear, on how it could be better, let alone perfect. So that's kind of that's kind of where we're going. Yeah, maybe I'll start with an example of last week we launched these things called Climate Circles in partnership with a local educator. And so we were meeting in the park, similar to this, but just a larger group of people, and we were talking about parks. And then there's this thing that our friend who runs the Climate Circles with us uh, created called a climate deck, and it's a deck of 100 cards with different questions. And so we're using those to facilitate conversation around climate change and climate in general, not just meaning environmental, but like social as well. And we started talking about the news, and this group of like 20 people, they all were like, but I just want news about Montreal. There's no news about Montreal that isn't clickbait BuzzFeed. We're in Montreal. They weren't just saying picking a random city. Oh, yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we can also perhaps in this semester through the different segments that might pop up. Normally we don't do segments, but this one's going to be a bit more segmenty yeah. because of the news topic. Bring a little bit of Montreal news. And I think that's where I would start with my ideal news would be a bit more local because there's no way to exactly filter that. And when you do filter for that, like I went on to some local like Montreal blog, CTV. That's the name for it, right? Montreal Montreal Blog? Montreal Blog is the most Montreal yeah. if we, news source. I think if we had an enemy or so scene, it would be Montreal Blog. Well, that's blog. a big spider. Oh. That's a big spider. <laughs> Ooh, we don't like that. Yeah, we always joke about ourselves as a very indoor kid. Um, but I feel like this It was time, on me. It was on me. As the, as the episode starts, I'm like, oh, I didn't bring sunscreen. I didn't put sunscreen on. Uh, oh, am I allergic to this leaf? Let's find out anyway. And then spiders all over us. We're just, ah, we need to go back into our cozy, insulated shelter. But yeah, Montreal Blog is one of those trendy hashtag IG news aggregators. It's just, mm-hmm. I mean, no offense to them, offense to them. But it's just no, like, but here's the thing. <laughs> when I was looking at different headlines about Montreal, all the other sites basically copy and pasted yeah. the same thing. Montreal Blog at least wrote their own article, from what I could tell. That's what they were the first to first to strike and then everyone else copies mm-hmm. from Montreal Blog. Yeah. That's a, the sorry state of journalism these days where I think, mm-hmm. you, yeah, you don't have to come up with anything original. No. You just, you just troll, copy, paste, mm-hmm. maybe reword if you're feeling... Uh, but they, like, like, a lot of them weren't, like, they literally were copy paste. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they'd add in like some quotation marks or some different like bullet point. But anyway, so Montreal Blog, it's basically just like, this new restaurant's opening, check what bars are, are doing happy hours this weekend, etc. Mm-hmm. It feels like everything's just geared towards a night on the town. Which, uh, there's, a, there's a place for it, but yeah, sometimes sure. you want to read obituaries. That's the thing. I know that's, like, dark, but there is no readily available newspaper, kind of. Like, I'm sure there is a Montreal newspaper. There's a Montreal Gazette. There's a few different yeah. things. But for young people... Sometimes you want something a bit more happening? Yeah. So I was thinking, like, what would I want? I'd want it local. I'd also want what's happening. I like, like newspapers used to have... No, but they used to have the movie showings... 
Ooh. I remember when I was a kid, it'd be like, this is what's showing the theater this week. And it's kind of fun. You can get excited. Like, obviously, you can go online and find it. But especially as two people who really like movies, there's so many different theaters around here. It'd be cool if there was a page that aggregated, like... Yeah. No, I have a, I have a website that I... I mean, I've, I've often bemoaned this to you, mm-hmm. where we'll be like, oh, such and such cinema is showing this Studio Ghibli film. It snuck up on us. Are we supposed to troll the cinema websites? Because there's what, five or so in Montreal within reach that we could kind of check out and, mm-hmm. and easily go to every single day or every single week. To see, like, it doesn't make sense. That mm-hmm. Also, in the age of the internet, they can't, there can't be a newsletter for that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think a, a happening, new, happening local news yes. featuring some obituaries and some happy hours mm-hmm. is a great starting point. We had the aspiration of recording outside and this semester, which is going to be revealing a bit more about ourselves, and Alicia says, a new era, shoes on screen. And I also thought, no cuts. Let's try and do it without cuts, even though I have a cold, so things might get a little bit uh, phlegmatic. And even though we're outside, so as we said, there might be sirens and planes. If there are people who walk behind in conversation, should we cut? We should probably cut, okay. at least blur. Because I don't want anyone to blur. feel nervous about yeah. being... Well, I think he was turned away from the camera. Yeah, we'll, we'll assess when we watch it back. Uh, my first note on the what do you want my news consumption to look like is and focused... Sorry. What? Another end? Yeah. Focused on my interests, which sounds really, I think, silly, because you might say you could always have it focused on your interests, but I realize that I'm kind of peripherally aware of way too many things I don't care about, or even not just I'm, I'm neutral on, but kind of dislike that mm-hmm. I don't want to know about. So I think, yeah, it's something to do with the internet, spending, having too much screen time, and just a curiosity, which should be more focused, yeah. made, made narrower or enacted upon narrower. So the examples I had were like the literature. I would really like to be one of those people who am up to date on current authors who's making waves new movements even award winners Mm -hmm. similar to the way we are with movies but i would like to be like that with books um what stops me on that is the fact that i never feel like i'm kind of qualified enough or or i haven't read enough of the, the classics to have a proper context for any kind of weirdo modern punctuation in the middle of the sentence type uh, authors. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I get that. Basically, it feels like there are too many classic books I haven't read, so it's like, why would I be reading this year's Mm -hmm. Booker Prize winner? Yeah, it's that's the difference between movies and literature, because movies are not that old, but literature is quite old. I also think I've watched a higher proportion of classic films that have classic uh, classic Mm -hmm. lit, because they're quicker. Quicker? Yeah, it takes a long time to read a book. But I think you can, I mean, anyone can hop in. Yeah, you can. You yeah. can hop in. But I just think, like, for instance, if I'm at a, because I think a big part of the news that I want to talk about is the communal, the reaction, uh, water cooler aspect to it. It's mm. so, like if I'm at a book club or some kind of writer's meeting or something, and I say, oh, did you hear, like, it's always going to be topical stuff, right? It's always going to be mm-hmm. new, like, did you hear about such and such, or did you read this thing? And I'm always, no, I was reading Dickens. Mm-hmm. You know, on the one hand, it makes it sound like a bit of a nincompoop, but also, yeah, you, you don't have as much to kind of bond with people over. That makes sense. Yeah. I think what this makes me think of is when I was designing my ideal news for myself, it was the mixture of pleasure and pain. Pain, I suppose. <laughs> because the thing is, we've both disconnected, I'd say almost 100% from the news because we were both so plugged in during the 2016 American election. Neither of us are American, as we said earlier, but we are so plugged in, so obsessively reading, refreshing headlines that we got sick of being on those sites and such. But now it's like the only way I learn about anything new, film news, is through word of mouth. Which, to an extent, I like, but that still means that someone has to be out there trolling those things. Yeah. So I was picturing, like, 
let's think Instagram. It's cool because you can follow all the local cinemas. You can follow perhaps The Economist and some different activists or journalists who are on the ground in different areas of the world that you want to know about. But even then, it's still mixed in with you're seeing your friend's new baby and you're yeah. seeing your friend's new puppy. It's I don't like, like IG. What if yeah. you don't want to be on screen? Exactly. But if you could do something that you don't have to curate yourself, that is curated for you, it's <laughs> centrist. Somehow made with paper and delivered to your yeah. door. But the thing with newspapers is that they're... I feel like the journalists aren't that good. So perhaps in the solo scene, the journalists need to be better, for one thing. We'll probably talk about journalism at length in the future. Yeah. But at curation of... I was thinking, okay, you run this paper, you say, perhaps, for example, there's this new development of conflict in a certain area of the world, and it's almost like they leave it at the development for you to then choose to engage with that, and then perhaps you could opt into like following that conflict if you'd like to, mm -hmm. so that it's not every single day trying to sensationalize with headlines and stuff, so you don't get desensitized to it. Well, I had, yeah, I had a couple points on that. One, it was kind of the parallel example to my literature one, which is mm -hmm. that regarding news, like big news, mm -hmm. like world news, I think ideally, like for me it's kind of case by case where I don't want to be indiscriminately following everything because I don't think it's mm -hmm. very healthy. But there are some stories that I would like to not be completely in the dark on. Mm -hmm. But then it's similar to what stops me from reading new fiction is that I don't have enough of a I don't know enough to even start learning about let's say Middle East mm -hmm. you know what I mean it's, it's I just feel too ignorant because I don't want to just start in 2023 or 2024 on a topic like that because I think it's almost almost pointless to do so that makes sense and I think sometimes I feel guilty for not engaging with all of these different issues that come up and I feel like issues isn't a strong enough word but these disasters that are happening around the world because I'm like everyone else is very engaged with them why do I feel like I can be disengaged that's like a privilege but then I realize that there's so many things happening that we don't even know about or that aren't being mainstream right so now. instead of the Palestine girl you could be the Sudan girl you mean not necessarily but it's just like I feel guilty for not engaging with activism and concepts of international importance yeah but then I realized that there's so many things happening right now that we don't necessarily know about or that are just very fringe on the news and on social media that are equally as important or tragic that I would also engage with if I had unlimited time. And that makes me feel slightly less guilty of just remaining very locally focused. Yeah. And I think that because there's so many people in the world, it's okay to have local activists and international activists, yeah, if you know what I mean. Of course. Um are you locally aware? I'm you, you pretty follow locally local news? aware. Yeah. Do you like doing that? I like following local news with through like word of mouth sort of thing. I was going to say that. Yeah, I had a I, that was something I I realized on making my notes was yeah I, re, I like to an extent uh, resolving said ignorance even not just local stuff but if I was talking to someone who knew about Russia Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I think I would enjoy more asking them questions than I would just reading up about it by myself. But it's also different when you have the perspective of the person. Like, one of my best friends is Ukrainian, moved to Canada when the war started, yeah. and that's kind of how I learned about it. And then I will choose to do any extra readings based on that, those conversations, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, like, I've attended pro-Ukraine protests in Montreal. How did I learn about them? Not through Montreal blog, but through her. We were saying that Montreal is the first place that both of us feel kind of, or at least for me anyway, feel geographically kind of proud or, or plugged in. Because mm -hmm. I've never felt, I think it's hard when you have a country so big as Canada to feel uh, patriotism in that proper sense. Yeah, for um, sure. But yeah, just being in Montreal, liking it so much, I am more interested in even things like when you mentioned oh, that highway that used to be here, it actually used to be like this until such and such. Yeah. And I was like, usually I would not <laughs> care about that whatsoever, but and now I'm still not fascinated, but at least listening. Um, 
or there were a lot of shenanigans at McGill, which is like Montreal's kind of the university that we live close to. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd say we, we both like kept up with that, which is yeah, the kind of thing that we don't, it, sure. we don't usually, I don't usually do anyway. Yeah, like that. I think that's also the benefit of living in a big city, because if you're living in a rural area, it's kind of like there's nothing going on. Yeah, and everything or, that goes on, uh, like when I just went, went to see my family a couple weeks ago, my dad was like, oh, what's new? Well, they twinned the highway between this and this. Yeah. And that, that's the kind of thing, yeah, it's hard to hard to be that interested in. Yeah, so that's like a difference between small and big cities. Because also, for example, with the there's an encampment at McGill supporting Palestine. And so it's like we can engage with this on the ground and in theory. But there's also these encampments happening all over North America. Yeah. And so perhaps if you weren't in a city where there was one, you'd be inclined to yeah. learn about all of them almost because you have no connection to any of them. But because we're here, we can learn about these people, their demands, but we and can so also, on. But we can also model this onto other things. So like, if you start talking to me about the same situation happening at a, a college in the US, mm -hmm. I'm not starting from zero is the kind of thing. And this is a... Yeah. I like that you mentioned that because one of my notes also was participatory pop culture or participatory arts uh, and less spectating. So like... That, that encampment is a good uh, thing. It's basically a bunch of people in tents with protest signs kind of occupying the space. Uh, we can just walk right into it if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Like, I see it all the time. And, um, yeah, you're kind of watching the news unfold. Like, basically, for the first time in a long time, it, it feels like I'm in, uh, aware of something that when it's being reported on, they are catching up to the things that I see and I know That's already. Uh, and so that feels, that feels kind of interesting. Like, another... Kind of softer example is um, you went to a, a Broadway rave last week. I did a few yes. days ago, um, and it's that kind of you were present at the thing. They were mm -hmm. playing a bunch of Broadway songs. You know what I mean? So people might be talking about Broadway, and you might hear new songs. Mm -hmm. news. Uh, it's stretching the definition a bit, but it's so so broad. I'm just taking it to mean anything new. Yeah, uh, you know, and it's very different from sitting at home and, and trolling Broadway websites and fan well, sites, which I'm sure there are. Yeah, that's the thing with any music or art of, that's how people used to learn new music, would be go out, the DJ would play it, because the DJ would be the expert on it, and you'd learn from them in person. You didn't have to get your Spotify recommended playlist or what have you. Mm -hmm. Cool. What do you think about opinion pieces? I like them. I like them a lot. I, I usually prefer them to reading the dry news, but this is... I'll touch on a, th a third note I had, which is how do I want my news consumption to be away from the comment section? Because I think I have an almost, I won't say compulsion, but like my impulse is often when I learn about something to check what people are saying about it. That makes sense. Which I think yeah. is, is, I think it makes sense. It's human nature. Yeah. But I also think it can be quite dangerous or at least quite kind of artificial. Um, I had this example where I was listening to music on an app, on Apple Music, and I, it was a new album, a new song that I really liked, and I kind of had the, I checked if there was a comment section on Apple Music, which I knew there wasn't, but I kind of had the idea, like, oh, that would be a neat thing, and it, it's not, like, it sounds like I'm really weak, like I'm kind of crowdsourcing my opinions, it's never the case, I always, I, I tend to have my opinion before I go into the comment section, but I'm, I, I don't know, I just have this thing where I like to see if people, what people are saying about it, like, regarding the song, it's like, do people like this as much as I do? Do they like it for the same reasons I do? Do they like that moment? Are they recommending other similar songs? That kind of stuff. Okay. And I think it started in it started with politics, where I gradually stopped reading the news in depth, uh, favoring instead the consensus, because I think in politics it can be more important to know what people are saying about such speech or such platform rather than the actual contents of such speech or, or such platform mm -hmm. just because your own opinion is obviously going to be secondary to the to the masses and kind of the, the when it comes voting time yeah but the I don't difference... think it's good I don't think it's good regarding art the difference in with op-eds as you mentioned is that that is one person's probably respectable or at least well-presented opinion rather than some drive-by YouTube comment that just says this sucks that's the thing and I feel like or a thousand of those. We've been engaging a lot in person with activists and such. We were at a conference just this week as well. And a lot of people were saying, but what about all of these people that are, they're unchangeable, they're very negative, they're cynical. And for me, I feel like 
no one is as cynical in person as they are in the comment section. And oh. same with opinion pieces. They're going to have to have sat with it at least for a few hours. Yeah. And it can still be a bit sensationalized and stuff, but it's not going to be as aggressively biased as a comment. Someone's kind of knee-jerk reaction because there's that saying of like, your first thought is not yourself, it's like your second thought or your action. Is that a saying? Yeah. Okay. It's not necessarily a saying, but it's a, it's a concept of you might... Someone like wrongs you and you're like, screw you is like your instinct. Mm -hmm. Then you're like, your empathy, your second thought or your action is what actually is who you are. Well, I think also with the comment section, it's interesting because it will provide often like dissenting opinion or, or criticism. So if I'm reading, let's say I dip my toe into reading about some conflict in the world. Mm -hmm. And then I think The Guardian has a comment section I think some other websites do as well. And then some of the comments are like, well, actually, this author forgot to mention, conveniently forgot to mention this, 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 and they're mm -hmm. sponsored by such and such. Yeah. Then you, you, you can rely on the comment section kind of do your research a little bit for you. Yeah. On the other hand, why would you, why can you trust that random in the comments? And it could also be a bot. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think it's difficult, the comment section. Um, but op-eds, I do enjoy reading them, but obviously you have to take them with a grain of salt compared to news news as in primary sources mm -hmm. i also had the kind of uh reflection that i think the reason i have this impulse is because i grew up in quite a culturally isolated that sounds ridiculous i was the only kid in my school who liked the things that i liked and i think part of it was because i was an immigrant so i raised was raised in the uk so i liked football everyone else liked hockey etc like various things I, I really liked to read classic books nobody else did and so because it was the fact that nobody wanted to talk about those things with me, I would often uh, spend much of my adolescence kind of escaping onto forums on the internet where people did like those things. Mm -hmm. um, but then it's a hard, very, very hard habit to get out of when you are an adult and can move to a place like Montreal where, in fact, almost everyone likes these kind of things, but you're still in the habit of thinking, of getting your kind of community from the screen. Mm -hmm. So, for sure. Also, I had a poem to open the episode, but we forgot it. Or I think you maybe just maybe t thought to yourself, like, oh, I'm not going to introduce him with the poem because we don't want to hear that. No, but I But I'm going to read it anyway. I forgot it with the poem, so yeah. Anyway. Um, Let us have it. <laughs> it says, O oh, mind of the world, your every thought mosaiced, mashed, by papers cut at random, fonts all mixed. Every dream a supercut of crowded city pics. O oh, silence, what silence? That which falls upon the finish of a blue haiku. Page decomposing in mud, where a little worm minds not its sentence. Bravo. Snaps from the crickets. Cricket, I would love that. I would love that if the crickets kind of... I don't know if that's the sound they make. Um, ended on a haiku. Slightly uh, weird thing that you had mentioned paper mache yesterday. I feel like you don't get two mentions of paper mache in a day. You had said it, of course, in the context of your gluten sensitivity to the flour, which used to cake on your skin and would, in fact, break you out in hives. Here I use it as this image of a, a mind of the world, I called it. It's quite a negative poem about how my brain feels when I've been overexposed to different news and it's mm. this idea of like the paper mache pig or something or like animal where it's just all snippets of headlines and papers right yeah none of them are fully legible but, there, but there's like a million of them uh that's how i think a lot of people's brains kind of feel in this internet age it's true due to the too much scrolling and the, the too much videos and stuff like that mm. and it's also it closes on this haiku which i think is an image of a, a healthy image of a newspaper rotting because it contrasts so vividly to the internet where everything is instantly preserved mm. archived in in its perfect form and i don't think we yet know the ramifications that has for history i don't mean the past but when today becomes history yeah all of its thoughts and primary sources will be like easily accessible and perfectly preserved for everyone like a hundred years from now if the servers you know don't burn or something yeah. Uh, and also for us as people, because usually you'd have to look back on a faded newspaper to see what the New York Times was saying about uh, 
JFK back in the day. Yeah, remember newspaper clippings? What about them? People would like clip out, if you were featured in the newspaper, or there would be like a story that they really wanted, they'd clip it out and they'd keep it. Right, like, now we share it on Facebook. Yeah, and I think the thing also with it being all digital is we don't remember anything for more than like yeah, of course. three it, minutes. It changes our memory. Because it's like, oh, it'll be there, I can refer back to it, but you don't even remember it to refer back to it because you're... Yeah, like, we, don't, we, don't, we don't properly attain the information anymore, we just rent it for a few seconds. Yeah, pretty much. Long enough to, to mention it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, the, my final thought on what do I want my news comp consumption to look like is at intervals, basically. I, as I said, I don't think it's healthy to be following this kind of stuff all day, every day. I don't think it's healthy for it to be in your pocket giving you updates when something happens across the world. Yeah. Um, 24-7, 365. I think that bombarding, at least for me, I, I, I guess I shouldn't try and speak broadly, but for me it doesn't feel healthy and uh, I would like to be able to meditate with a quiet, peaceful mind and I think that kind of, um, yeah, overstimulus uh, is, is, is detrimental to that. I even think a daily newspaper for me would be too much. I was thinking about that because as we were saying in preparation for this, with the internet semester that we did in the past, it was very transformative, mm -hmm. I would say. It changed how we both engaged with the internet and we got a bit more tactile with our, got a alarm clock, got a thermometer for our window, mm -hmm. these types of things. And I know it's like silly and small, but with this one, I was thinking, oh, we should subscribe to a newspaper or a yeah, magazine. I was that too. And I think we should, it'd be cool. The New Yorker. Well, I was subscribed to the New Yorker for years, never read it. But I do like, I like The Economist. <laughs> I like their nice reporting. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I think that'd be cool, but I would like it, yeah, a weekly interval, I think. The thing is that we have different, uh, different interests. But we can each pick one. Yeah, I would, I think there's one called The Paris Review, which is a, a literary mag magazine rather than newspaper. Mm -hmm. Maybe when it's about culture, they call it a magazine. Yeah. I think that's interesting. Uh, but I'm going to call it all news. Another example about this interval thing I had is movie trailers and movie posters where the production of hype is almost as, um, people follow that almost as identically as the film when they start to, when they start to finally watch that. Yeah, that's actually for, so true. For two hours after two years of following its, its casting and its set picks and its teaser, then its trailer, then its trailer two and its posters and its alternate posters and, um, I've done that in the past, but I think we've both found it infinitely more rewarding and more ex just more exciting when you just go in raw yeah. without knowing anything. Like for last year, Miyazaki, Hayao Miyazaki's film The Boy and the Heron, we knew that it had been in production for many years. Uh, we'd watched, we read one uh, story about how slowly they were animating it, which just built mm -hmm. up the hype, uh, knew the title abstained from watching any trailer and I was even we tried to avoid posters yeah I was very grateful for that yeah um, because we knew we were going to go see it so what's the point like I think the trailer in its original intent was trying to make people interested in this trying to mm -hmm. make them go see it we knew we were going to go see it like another example is I was telling you like Robert Eggers has a new movie coming out a Nosferatu film yeah this is overlap of my two interests so it's like I know I'm going to go see it and I started watching the trailer and then I had to stop myself because I was like why would I why do I need to see this? Um, Overlap of your three interests. What is it? Willem Dafoe. Oh yeah, I forgot Willem Dafoe. <laughs> but imagine if I didn't know that though. That's true, You would have, your mind would have been blown. Because there have been times that he gave us jump scares in films and we were like... Yeah, the opposite of jump scares. Jump, he gives us Santa Clauses. Yes, yeah, excellent. Um, so yeah, I just think when you went to the cinema and they would play something, uh, that would, that's so, such a lost kind of magic to that. Mm -hmm. Is that, I mean, again, I don't want to be too critical, but for me, I hope to never feel the need to watch a trailer at home. Yeah. For the first time, at least. Headline Hyuk. Oh, goodness me. So one of, like, the third episode of our old podcast that we used to have. Old heads this will is know. Not, this is not a plug. Do, yeah. not, <laughs> do not seek it out. You seek it out. It was on YouTube. It's called When Leo Met Greta. Oh my it, goodness. The, the story at the time was Leonardo DiCaprio meeting Greta da Vinci. Greta Thunberg. Yes. But we had this idea a long time ago that we could go through headlines and review them, yeah. sort of. About and then we bit. quickly realized that it's not a soul. I mean, it wasn't even soul scene back then. 
but this is not a good concept because there's so many people but reacting. In any case, we, we were so excited about this alliterative name for the segment we came up with called Headline Hook yeah. that we actually composed a, a well, jingle. improvised, I think, a, a jingle on a, on a ukulele. Yeah, um, and then Aaron introduced played. it by saying Headline Hook, but for some reason just couldn't say it. And we didn't <laughs> edit it, we didn't change it. Well, um, we definitely didn't edit back then, but also for some reason, I sound like I'm about 10 meters away from the microphone. And 10 years old. I have, well, 10 months old. Uh, <laughs> like a baby and like i'm i have every every lisp and impediment under in the book and also like i'm just adding every i think there's an umlaut above the o and just like every single there's a few extra y's in there so i just kind of sound like headline yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was very strange and i mean like anyway so that's that was that was referencing for the um, the few who may remember. Yeah, this is going to be. But now a... we're going to introduce some headlines and our lessons we learned from them, perhaps. This will be a recurring segment through the semester. Every episode, we will bring a headline. Uh, but today, we're each bringing one. Yeah. And I guess we'll call it headline of the week. Yeah. But really, it's called headline. It's headline yeah. hook. If we had merch, that would be on it. We H-Y-U-K. don't have merch. UK. We do have clothes. We do sell clothes. Maybe, should we plug that? Yeah, we have a clothing line. It's uh, cool. All handmade the, by me. The, all upcycled. The, so. the website. Yeah. <laughs> We're also at Markets in Montreal for those of you markets who are around. Montreal. So, my headline. Montreal has just been ranked one of the world's most congested cities. Here's why. Really? Yeah. I wouldn't have put it in the top... I wouldn't have guessed it in the top... Like, hundred. Well, this is the thing. This is what I wanted to talk about, is the difference between headlines. If you're not here, you're reading it, you're going to think, oh, Montreal is so congested, it's a horrible place to drive. Trudeau. Because basically my whole life, I remember it being said, never drive through Montreal. Because I'm from Canada. People would drive around, they'd drive coast to coast, or even just drive to the States and go through Montreal. But this was like the law. Do not drive through Montreal. We move here. It's a beautiful city. Super walkable, super bikeable. But the thing is, I imagine, from what I was reading through these articles, is, yeah, the city is fine, like the core, the heart of the city, but getting out of it, the urban sprawl, mm. the fact that people are being forced to live outside of the city due oh, to yeah. cost I'm, of living and stuff. Even the few times that we've driven in and out, the traffic has been... It's horrible. Not so. But I also around, thought that was the case in every American city. Well, that's the city. thing. Yeah. So basically, it, it's ranked number two in Canada, so it's not even number one. Like, Toronto is worse for congestion, and it was ranked very objectively, like, based on hours lost in traffic safety all of these things so it's not just like vibes and then in the world it was ranked number 30 in the world which i was still surprised with but the top 10 were like new york tokyo san francisco I so it's just every lot major of other city cities have better transit than montreal probably that's the thing like, the transit not, was not a big just part of it within the city but around the country mm-hmm. yeah i guess that makes sense yeah I but can... it was still misleading why because i think it would make people not want to live in montreal where did you source this from? Time Out magazine. Time Out? Yeah. They have a food court. Yeah. My favorite thing. food court. So they started it as a food review. And they have the wow. Time Out market in the food court. Are they affiliated with Time? I don't think so. Yeah. But anyway, I also wanted to talk about how in the soul scene, there won't be these lists, these rankings. There's rankings for everything. It'll yeah. be like the three hottest trees in Montreal Park. It's like no one, I feel like they just get so niche, these rankings. <laughs> Because I remember I used to be so obsessed with the idea of getting on one of these lists of like the top 30 under oh, 30, 30, under 30. Those types of things. But now I'm like, there's a 30 under 30 for like... What about the most influential? No. Yeah, it was nonsense. But now there's like, yeah, hundreds of them. And it's like not meaningful anymore to be on one of these lists. And the lists are just sensationalized, easy to like get people to click on it, yeah. got me to click on it. Yeah. The only thing I would like to be part of is the sexiest man list. Mm. But we might be a ways away from that one. Um, it, but this, don't you think it has merit? Congestion, seeing how traffic, how you rank up uh, globally? Yeah, it was still like, it was still an interesting headline. I didn't want to bring something that I was completely uninterested in. What I'm saying is because it's not, that's not opinion. Yeah, it's so just fact. It, it seems like it would be mm-hmm. c- contrast with the three nicest trees. Yeah. Is it news? Did you like it? Did you like reading it? It was a terribly written article to be honest okay and this was one of the ones this made me realize the copy and paste because i went on to see other people's opinions of it and it was just the same it was basically like this is what this organization who ranked it said yeah. just like the facts that's always it and then it was a list of these are the top 10 cities in the world the people who actually collate the data or 
um, do the study, mm -hmm. will put out a couple paragraphs. Yeah, and it's just... Everyone else just copy and paste that. Mm -hmm. They don't even bother with... I mean, I guess it's better than the recipe style. I'm going to write 19 paragraphs. But, like, interview them. Yeah. I feel like that's the thing. Journalism used to be... Or provide some context. Mm -hmm. It used to be this. You can't even be bothered to do that. This yeah. is a change from in 2020 when such yeah. and such. That's neat. Kind of boring, though. Kind of boring. Uh, mine is called A Long-Awaited Homecoming for Peregrine Falcons in the Finger Lakes. <laughs> okay. Do you know what the Finger Lakes are? I don't know what the Finger so Lakes already, are. So already it brings you curiosity. Mm. And the fact that I read this online, it was on... Where was this on? It was on a website called allaboutbirds.org which is a Cornell lab thing. It's actually really a, a very nice website. Um, but the fact that you read these things online, when you come across the term finger lakes, what's that? Mm. I can you open can a new tab and yeah. look it up. And they know that. And they know that. Um, so, but I think everyone knows where the finger lakes are. Squirrel, not quite guesting, but maybe we can coax her over here. I met a rabid squirrel a few weeks ago. Yeah. Um, that leapt at me from a garbage You fear tank. unlocked. So, yeah, be careful out there, I suppose. Um, the Finger Lakes are uh, a bunch of lakes basically below or south of uh, Lake Ontario. They're in okay. upstate New York, which is where this article takes place. It's talking about the specific area, I'll try and pronounce it, called the Tuganook Creek, which is in New York. The return of peregrine falcons there nesting after 70 years. Oh. Yeah. This is an article from 2021. Most of it, I think, was um, written and observed during the COVID lockdowns. Um, it's, a, it's a long read. It has a lot of words and some pictures punctuating it. Have you ever come across these? Mm -hmm. I enjoy reading fewer articles, but they're more like this. Yeah. They're more like stories than several articles yeah i, I agree I realize, um there's somewhere between this one at least was somewhere between news and just non-fiction writing mm. but i very much enjoyed its kind of photojournalism as well because there were these close-ups of the nest so the the author of the article his name is andy johnson would be writing the story of what happened these two tiny tiny downy white chicks who emerged and then you'd see them in the next picture. So I guess it's a bit um, attention spanny, but it was still, yeah, it made for a very engaging experience. It was also well written. It was written almost like a nature, like a nature writer rather than a news journalist, if that makes sense. That makes like sense. He used a lot of adjectives and uh, it was very atmospheric. I learned a new word, as I told you last night, mm -hmm. guano. Guano. Do you remember what it means? I don't know what it means. Uh, bird poop, especially that, mm. which, that which is uh, used for fertilizer. Nice. And the story is about these peregrine falcons who were one of the inaugural species on the endangered lists in America in the uh, 70s. Okay. And one of the kind of poster boys for the, or poster child for the DDT uh, thinning of the bird shells. I didn't know the DDT relationship to these guys. Right, and they were taken off the endangered list in 1999, mm -hmm. which was a big thing because, as I said, they were one of the first species because there was a lot of uh, kind of organized captive breeding to try and bring the, level, bring the numbers back up in North America, which worked, but they had still never been seen in this one, this one place, uh, which is a really nice-looking waterfall. Apparently, it's taller than Niagara Falls, and, yeah, it's... Uh, they came back, or at least a few came back. Okay. I think remedying my real, real, like, elementary school um, gaps of geography is something that I like doing, even as a side thing while reading the news, because mm -hmm. it's like, oh, I learned about the Finger Lakes. That might be a household term, but I've never heard it before. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting. They kept using phrases like, oh, there's nothing nesting east of the Mississippi. I know people say that, but I couldn't draw the Mississippi on a map. Mm -hmm. So I look it up and I see roughly where the Mississippi cool. is. And then you have that in the back of your mind. And for some reason, I just think when you're, when you're reading fewer of them and therefore engaging with these things, engaging with less of these things, I only learned one new word, uh, a couple new geographical terms and the story of one species, I'll remember it more. Whereas if I tried to read five, 
Yeah. I would, I would not. Well, that's the thing you're actually learning. I listened to a few podcasts with the co-host called Michael Hobbs, who used to be a journaler, journaler? Ooh, journaler. For several different major news sites. Journalist? Journal. I don't know. Is that gendered? No. Jo okay, journalist, sorry. It seems like a very feminine word. <laughs> anyway. I'm a journalista. Journalista, okay, sorry. He's a journalist. He's not gendered, um, And he used to say, like, people would come to me because they thought I was an expert on the topic, but all I did was actually read the report. So, for example, it would be, like, the IPCC report, which is on the annual report on climate change. Yeah. And he'd be like, I was just the only journalist out there that actually read it. And then people consider me an expert. Mm -hmm. But he's not an expert. He never studied climate change or whatever. But it's just... It's funny that if you actually read yeah. a couple articles in their entirety, you become and, and like... And read them. Yeah. Something I noticed while reading this was how frequently I skim, which is to say mm. all the time I skim. Big skimmer. But I think skim the milk? internet has no. conditioned us to do this because there's so much garbage mm -hmm. and most of it's written by people, it's copy and pasted or it's just trash yeah. writing. Like recipe, you're going to read every word of that, no. you're going to skim to the recipe or mm -hmm. you're just going to skip to the recipe. Almost everything I'll read, but also sometimes it's... Here's some context I don't care about. Here's some names and dates I don't need to know. Mm. I'll just skip to the... Which is not really good. And I was reminded of, like, when we were in grade school and you'd do the reading comprehension assignments, they'd give you a page, read it, and then ask you, like, oh, so what was the name of that group? What mm. date did that happen? And you could always... You'd know it. Yeah. Uh, but now it's, it's not the case. That's true. Um, but I'm trying to get better at this. Yes. So I think that'll be also a, an intention for the semester... I chose this birding one because, again, to get into some personal news, I, I want to bird. I think I want to become a birder. Mm -hmm. um, maybe not make it my whole personality, but at least I would like to be able to recognize some birds, some calls, maybe some of the ones that feature in this episode. And birding just seems like such a wonderfully collaborative and grassroots kind of amateur um, hobby anyway like mm -hmm. all the contributions to like for instance all the, the people who were rewilding these peregrines or, or catching them spot even just spotting them like that helps right mm -hmm. that helps the cause and they weren't all affiliated with labs and they weren't all professional ornithologists if that's even a thing i'm sure it is but most of them aren't they're just like oh yeah that peregrine that's in my backyard usually it's not there anymore and mm -hmm. then cornell lab goes oh interesting and they find, like it, it actually is it's yeah worthwhile knowledge for mapping these so I, I love that element of kind of species migration or habitat change habitat loss uh, numbers being tracked not just by an institute but by just randos in their backyard with, with some binoculars and I would I would love to be one of those randos I think okay this is your challenge for the week is learn a bird that would be in the park and I'll learn a plant species and we can present it tomorrow Next or on our next episode. Yeah, I also had a solo scene recommends because, okay. as you know, I was getting ready for the Broadway rave and I watched the Newsies. And I feel like that's very Newsies. relevant to this semester. So solo scene recommends the Newsies. It's on Disney+. Plus. Is it called the Newsies or just Newsies? I don't know. I would love it to be just Newsies because I like, bang. Newsies. It was, it was interesting. It was an experience. But it was cool to kind of learn about the history of news and the printing press and so on. So highly recommend. And we'll probably talk a bit about the history of news on a future episode yeah for sure so on with the rest of our canada day gonna go home listen to the podcast then share the podcast with all you so hope you all have a wonderful day and can't wait to see you next week